how I started. Hi, my name is Andrew Dudley and this is Earth Live, a webcast featuring interviews with people working on the front lines of conservation. Today we're joined by a conservation hero, Nigel Sizer, who is in Mount Kisco up in New York. How are you doing, Nigel? Very good. Nice to see you, Andrew. Yeah, welcome to Earth. So, Thank you. Uh, can we ask you what it is that you do, please? What do I do? I, I'm the Chief Program Officer at Rainforest Alliance. That's my official job. Uh, and I help out on quite a few other things as well related to the global environment, uh, working very hard on uh, stuff related to the pandemic as well right now. So all sorts of things. And just to go back a little bit back in time, what was your first experience of the natural environment? How, how young were you when you first got the bug and you knew that you were going to devote your career to conservation? I don't know how young I was. I mean, I remember being very aware of these issues when I was a teenager. Uh, I studied science and ecology at university, so obviously was getting into it in a big way then. I traveled a lot uh, in Africa, especially in my late teens, backpacking around. I think that really, probably that really put the bug in me, backpacking around in Africa in the mid-1980s. That really changed my life. We hear that from a lot of people, a lot of other conservation heroes, that travel played a, a huge role yeah. in them realising what, what, what the planet was about, basically, and the natural environment. Could you tell us a story or two when you were out in Africa, at any moments where you were like, wow, this is incredible? I think there's a couple of, a couple of things that really, the kinds of things that happened on that trip. It was, it was a seven-month trip, and I hitchhiked across Africa, starting in North Africa, went across the Sahara, and down into Central Africa and then over into East Africa. It was an amazing trip, Cra crazy, crazy trip, dangerous. It was really only the kind of thing you do when you're 18 years old. Uh, I ended up going through a refugee camp. This, there, was a, there was famine going on. So seeing, literally seeing starving people, uh, people fighting over, over waste trash that I discarded, yeah, to eat it, stuff like that, as, as I was traveling through that area. That was just mind blowing, right? In terms of, you know, how can this happen? We have to do something about this. This is the injustice is, is beyond words, yeah. People are starving in a world where there's plenty of food for everybody. Uh, I saw, uh, I took a river trip with a couple of thousand people on a giant suite of barges up the Congo River from Kinshasa to Kisangani. Uh, this was in the Mobutu regime. Uh, unbelievable, right? So, so it was a, it's one of the great river journeys of the world. And uh, there was remarkable brutality and violence on the boat, uh, squalor, and as, as we chugged our way up the river, surrounded by the rainforest, yeah, incredible experience. Two weeks on a, on a giant riverboat in the Congo. Uh, in East Africa, visiting for the first time in my life, yeah, those, some of those absolutely iconic marvels of the natural world, the great savannah ecosystems of East Africa and seeing elephants and giraffes and lions and cheetahs and all that stuff firsthand um, visiting Gombe Stream where Jane Goodall was working at that time still and spending a week there just to, just backpacked my way in and hung out there and hung out with her chimpanzees and just all of this got me so riled up about what we need to do the incredible beauty of nature, especially tropical nature, and how special that was, how different it was from anything I'd grown up with. Uh, and that set me on this this journey I've been on ever since. Thank you for sharing that, Nigel. That's fascinating. So what did you do then? Did you go to university and what did you study? So then, so then I went to Cambridge and I studied natural sciences at Cambridge, uh, biology basically, and that I sort of specialized into plant biology and then into tropical rainforest ecology and ended up doing a PhD on that in the Brazilian Amazon. So incredibly lucky. I, I We raised grant funding and, and off I went and I lived in Brazil for two and a half years without coming back in the in Manaus, in the, which is a city in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon, right at the heart of the Amazon where the Amazon River meets the Rio Negro.
and uh, did uh, classic field research in little tiny camps deep in the jungle, collecting, studying, measuring, being bitten, getting sick, very hot, very sweaty, very uncomfortable, and every day seeing species of animals and plants that you know feature in david Attenborough's latest documentaries or whatever right mm. they were right there it was it was a virtually untouched forest that we were working in with no uh, at that time no human presence at all in the forest so the wildlife was intact every day monkeys macaws amazing green tree frogs uh jaguars and so on just incredible wildlife so i lived with that and that got me really passionate about the amazon rainforest and helped me at that time you know become one of the fairly small number of people in the world who who had done that kind of research there and and i and i you know had a phd in tropical rainforest amazonian tropical rainforest ecology what 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 could be better than that to, to then start a career with um and i thought i might sort of continue doing fairly academic style work for a while continuing to do research while i was in brazil i got very involved in leading some efforts to address some human rights abuses not far from where we were working, not far meaning several days' journey by boat away, uh, where the Brazilian government was expelling uh, local communities from a huge national park, uh, claiming that they were destroying the park. We went in there, we studied it. No one, had, no one had been in there from outside, yeah, at all. We went in there, visited these people. Some of them had never met white people before, let's say, and um remarkable experience and of course we documented that they were actually helping to protect the nature living in that forest uh and we we lobbied strongly and produced scientific materials to support that position uh, and that got me very interested in sort of the more the policy politics and the policy side of this and how the social justice side of of of, of the world intersects with the environmental world and and how we need to be moving those two along together to make real progress and what's been your trajectory from from then until now as a, a rainforest alliance from there i i basically worked with a series of global environmental organizations and also for a short period with the united nations on those issues uh, some of it uh sort of roughly half of it sort of at the global level working on major global political and policy processes related to forests and climate change and biodiversity. And the other half at the local level, on the ground, in Brazil, in Africa, in Indonesia, I spent 10 years living in Indonesia, working with different organizations there, uh, trying to advance these agendas, this work at different scales. And so Rainforest Alliance, you, you started working there. When Could you tell us a bit more about that organization when it was established? So I joined Rainforest Lines five years ago. It was founded in the mid-1980s, uh, and it has steadily grown. Our mission basically is to create a more sustainable world, and we're focused on uh, sustainable agricultural systems and forest conservation and landscape management. What we're best known for, most visible for, is our work certifying cocoa, coffee, bananas, and other products. So many people would see the little round seal emblem with the green frog inside. The green frog is our logo. And they would see Rainforest Alliance certified on, on cocoa products, coffee, tea, products like Lipton's tea and so on carry that, uh, which mean that they've been produced in a way that is consistent with the uh, certification standard that is called the Rainforest Alliance Sustainable Agriculture Standard that we have developed and we manage that whole system. So that's what we're most well known for. Um, roughly half the organization works on that. And the other half is working on the ground in often quite large landscapes with the local communities, the local farmers uh, to protect nature, to work on more sustainable farming. The biggest threat to remaining forests is expanding agriculture. 
so working on our our food systems and how food is grown and produced and traded and so on is is pretty much the most important thing we can do to help protect the remaining rainforest areas and other natural habitats around the world and just going back to the supply chain so for these large organizations sourcing commodities in the equatorial tropics what are the biggest challenges that you guys are faced with so there's deforestation there's the human rights issues could you take us through that a little bit please yeah well if we start on the environmental side and our work is quite comprehensive it works across all of these areas yeah uh, on the environmental side deforestation soil conservation the chemicals that farmers are using, that they're using the chemicals they're using, they're using properly and safely, that they're not using banned chemicals, which are sadly widely available in many countries. And farmers quite like them because they're, they're very effective though, although they're very dangerous. Uh, water quality issues. So for example, in coffee farms, there's often some local processing of the coffee beans, the coffee fruits after they've been harvested, being washed and so on and that contaminates water, leaving the farms. So that whole suite of things, uh, the climate side of it, climate smart agriculture, as we call it. So working with the farmers to uh, use practices which result in more organic matter being stored in the soil. So being careful about how they're using uh, compost, how they're working with the leaf litter and other debris on the ground to try to increase the amount of organic matter going into the soil, which stores more carbon in the ground, which is good for producing climate change, but it's also great for the farm because it holds water and nutrients better in the soil as well. That's, so on the environmental side, it's those kinds of things, the biodiversity, forest, the water, the chemicals. Uh, then on the social side, you've got uh, some very, very serious issues like child labor, right? Very common in cocoa production in West Africa that's there's there's quite likely to be child labor uh associated with the cocoa that you consume when you buy a chocolate product in the high street uh slave labor including slave labor of children right even worse uh there are more slaves in the world today than there ever have been ever wow. mind-boggling yeah um uh, forced labor of various kinds. So you've got all the sort of labor rights stuff. You've, and then on the, in the larger farming operations, you've got issues around abuse of the labor force, right? So underpayment of wages, taking money out of people's paychecks that shouldn't be, you know, deductions that shouldn't be taken out by the employer and paying, pay, even paying a basic wage as, as they promised the workers, all these sorts of things. Issues with migrant labor. So it's a whole area around labor, incredibly important. Um, uh, we are working very hard also sort of on the positive side of that then to increase the amount that's paid for the commodities and get that premium, right? So you want company wants Rainforest Alliance certified cocoa, okay, well you should pay more for it and we are working to get as much of that premium and more back right down into the pocket of the farmer that produced it on the ground it doesn't get taken up caught up somewhere in the middle by the traders or or even by the cooperative that the farmer is part of locally so getting more money into the farmer's pockets for managing the land more sustainably so that is great for reducing poverty that's the most direct way to reduce poverty is people having more money um, and gives them an incentive to continue uh farming in more and more in a more and more sustainable way uh, and that whole economic piece of this is really important as well so the enterprises have to be viable financially otherwise they're not going to be sustainable either so we're combining all of those things together in our sustainable agriculture standard and managing a process which certifies the farmers against that standard so we interviewed Atel Higane from Mighty Earth. In fact, yesterday yeah. we were talking about the documentary that just came out, Rotten, uh, The Dark Side of Chocolate on Netflix. Yeah. For people who haven't seen that, it's well recommended. But yes. what's shocking is the, you know, the per tonnage price on cacao from 1970 was $5,700 and it's gone down to 1917 which is incredible. You know, it's so what you guys are yeah. asking for is for the, for, you know, for the big companies to start paying a fairer price to the farmers on the at the beginning of the supply chain. 
Yeah, and basically what's happened there is the market at work, yeah, and it can be very problematic. So you've got, you've had growing supply, you've had growing demand as well, right? So now, for example, China consumes significant quantities of chocolate, which they didn't use to, uh, but supply has grown as well. And it's a commodity. So the price goes up and down on the commodities markets. The traders are making that as efficient as they possibly can. And where things are right now is, yeah, prices are low. It's not just cocoa as well. It's the same for coffee. And it's the same for quite a, quite a number of other uh, food commodities as also. Palm oil is also quite low. And when the prices are low, of course, that means the farmer has a much lower income. So poverty levels are high in cocoa communities when the prices are low. Uh, and even when the prices are higher, it's hard for the cocoa farmers to make a lot of money. They're often, the farms themselves are often quite small. The quality of the cocoa trees is, is often not as good as it should be. The pruning and other practices that are used could be improved. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff we can we can work on with the farmers to improve the basic productivity. But at the end of the day, if the price is really low, you can do all of that, double your productivity. But if the price is still terrible, then you're going to get, you know, twice twice terrible as your income, and that's not going to be enough to feed your family, and certainly not to send your kids to off to get a good education and so on. And by the way, of course, that feeds back into child labour. So poorer farmers are much more likely to employ their own children and, of course, not pay them. Of course, they're, they're their own children being put to work on the farms um, and, and, and look for other children that can do the work as well because it saves money. And it can be quite hard for them to escape from that if their income is very, very low. So that's why the premium that's paid for a Rainforest Alliance certified cocoa is very important. We call it a sustainability differential. So so you'll pay more for the product because you know that there's it's a more sustainable product. Uh, but the extent to which we can do that depends on the willingness of large companies to pay that premium. Um, and we can only push that so far. Uh, fair trade, of course, have have uh, have another system which in many ways is quite similar to ours one big difference with theirs is that they that they fix the price and demand a certain minimum price we're, we're actually trying to get above the fair trade prices uh, sometimes we succeed other times not sometimes they run into serious difficulties with customers switching because they don't want to pay the price so that comes back to the power of the end consumer. And this is, you know, for people listening to this, when you are buying these products, it's important for you to make your opinion about this heard and uh, communicate with the major retailers, the Tesco's, the Walmarts, and so on, who are doing good stuff on this. And, you know, keep it up. We want to see more of this. You're talking about an extra penny or two on the final product to the consumer. So, so people mostly would, would really not notice this, hardly notice it. Uh, and if that gets back down the supply chain, that can be making a really big difference to the farmer because the percentage of the cost of that candy bar or whatever that the farmer gets is, of course, a very tiny percentage of the overall cost. So some companies are doing some great work on this. Others have a lot of catching up to do. And talking of those other companies, what advice would you give the CEO or the shareholders of those organizations moving forward? That they need to do the right thing fundamentally, right? This is not, we're no longer living in the 19th century where you can have rampant, labor exploitation in your supply chain and your factories anymore maybe you can still get away with that because of where you're sourcing from in some senses but but you're on the wrong side of history if that's if that's what your profitability depends upon uh, and consumers increasingly uh, are repelled by that and are expecting 
especially major brands and major companies, to ensure that that is not what's happening in their supply chains. They expect you to deal with that. Um, and, you know, a penny or two more on the product uh, is not, should not be an issue. So get serious about it if you're not. And if you, and if you don't, then you really are running huge risks, right, of, of, of exposure, of very negative media coverage, and customers just drifting off to other brands that they feel have more purpose, take a more responsible approach. Thank you, Nigel. So just moving on to the COVID-19 pandemic, what lessons are there for us? There are such important lessons from this pandemic. The pandemic would not have happened if we didn't have, or let's say the risk of it would have been greatly reduced if we didn't have you know, a thoroughly broken relationship with the rest of nature. We're part of nature, we're not separate from it, even though we often behave as if we are. Uh, so similar to what's happening to the global climate, we are exploiting animals on an unprecedented scale around the world. and. Wild animals and farmed animals are hosts to hundreds of thousands of viruses and other disease-causing organisms, which those animals have adapted to to varying degrees, have immunity to, to, to varying degrees, and can spill over into humans. This virus, uh, a coronavirus, is exactly the type of virus that scientists have been predicting, predicting for years uh, could spill over from wild, wild animal populations, especially from bats. Uh, and um, so this was absolutely predicted by scientists. Uh, the countries where there's high risk of this happening could take, relat let's say, relatively simple and relatively low cost measures that would greatly reduce the risk of this happening. The whole world could help them to do that by helping to pay for that. Latest estimates are this pandemic has cost us about $30 trillion globally and a completely, you know, a very comprehensive approach to pandemic, pandemic prevention would cost uh, 10 to $20 billion a year. Right, still a large amount of money, but you've got to put it in context with the thirty trillion, and then just think about the human suffering. I mean, how much? That's you know, how, what is the price of of your grandmother dying from this, or or another relative or friend or something? Right, that's that's a that's an unimaginable cost that none of us can really quantify. Economists somehow managed to do that. Uh, but it's really, you know, of infinite value as that human life to, to each of us when it happens. So this was preventable. We need to do everything we can to stop it happening again. I've been working hard on pulling together a coalition to take a series of actions precisely to do that, working with various other organizations. We're putting in place the building blocks to do that. What we are learning as we do that is is quite extraordinary. Uh, maybe maybe I was very naive coming into this, but we're learning that generally in the health world, it's hard to get money to do prevention. The health world does not put a lot of money into prevention of anything. It, nearly all of the health spending goes on treatment and cures and medicine and so on, rather than on stopping the diseases in the first place. So that's that's well known if you're a public health expert. It surprised me. Um, it shows how how backwards we have policy just sort of in the core public health space. As we've been approaching major donors and other organizations to work with us and support this, they've all recognized how important it is. Many of them are now working with us to put this together. Several, though, the first thing they say is, we don't have a program that does this, so we can't do it. Hmm. Okay. Well, it's not surprising you don't have a program that does this because, you know, this is now, right, this is kind of a new thing for decision makers to deal with. Um, is that a reason not to do it? 
it's so you'd have thought that this would be we're, we're used to these frustrations in our work on climate change yeah, and, and deforestation where these are sort of long term relatively sn- slow moving issues although they're accelerating uh, beyond the political life of, of an elected official this is like right now massive incredible impacts but we're getting the same kind of responses from some quarters so that's really scary and it says to me you know fundamentally as a society we've got to get so much smarter about how we prevent predict uh these kinds of things and 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 put resources into into what's needed to, to prevent things like this from happening. There are very deeply fundamental things about the way our minds work and the way our societies have developed and our institutions are structured that seem to make it very hard for us to do that, whether it's diseases, climate change, biodiversity, and you can probably think of lots of other things as well. So so we've got some serious work to do there. For sure, it reminds me of a phrase from years ago, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, a few, a few, how much would have prevented this? A few hundred million dollars well spent in Southeast Asia would have reduced the likelihood of this happening by, what, half, 80%? 95 percent well we can't we can't know for sure but those are the kinds of numbers we're talking about here yeah and so, so yeah. yeah i was going to say so you know there's a lot of challenges ahead what, what are you most positive about well i am i'm optimistic about big picture political trends globally uh, I look forward to uh, some very important countries moving on from extremely destructive populist leadership. Um, the United States, of course, first and foremost, but there are several others as well. Uh, they tried that, and it's been a complete disaster. You just look at the coronavirus numbers and you see some remarkable relationships between where you have people like that in charge, US, Brazil, uh, and and where you've had Russia, where you have, you know, absolute public health disaster taking place that could have been prevented. So I look forward to that. I think I think we've learned in the last few years, we knew this of course, but we've been reminded that what happens in elections can incredibly dramatically change almost overnight the course of the world in addressing some of these challenges uh, and uh, hopefully we've been learning our lesson from that and the pendulum will swing back in the direction that's much more about real democracy healthy democracy based on good scientific and technical advice uh, proper participation across the political spectrum uh, and and cooperation and collaboration between different political interests rather than uh, the awful polarization that we're seeing. Yeah, exactly. And you know, in your own careers, uh, have you had a high and a low across your career that you could share with us? I kind of have highs and lows every day, I think. It, it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and fortunately, there are often often highs. Yeah, there's small victories, whatever. That's like, okay, you know, someone's joining the partnership, or uh, some new funding that comes in, or a victory in terms of a policy reform and a change on the ground, a company changing how it's working. So we see a lot of good things happening every single day. Um, I I think. Uh, What's, what's, what's surprised me is as I've sort of come into my 50s to get more personal about this is, is you know, if, if I go back 15, 20 years, I was sort of thinking I'd be maybe retiring by now and having a little farm with my 
wife who's from Indonesia having a little farm in the hills of Bali somewhere and sort of stepping back and and enjoying that um, and instead exactly the opposite is going on yeah I'm busier than ever working on more things than ever that build upon the experience that I've acquired and I see people around me doing the same thing yeah mm -hmm. and I look forward and see people who I work with some in their 70s some in their 80s who are doing almost more and more year after year as the urgency is growing but of course enjoying that mm -hmm. making a difference enjoying making a difference and taking a lot of satisfaction from that even even if some of the trends and challenges are, are, are very daunting. And that brings me to my next question. For a young aspiring conservationist, what advice would you have for them? Be, be very bold and stay true to your values. Spend time out there in the forest or the water or whatever it is that you love uh, a lot of time and really immerse yourself in it and then take that passion and wisdom that that's given you and fight politically for change. And do you have a book that's inspired you throughout your career that you, you could share with others to read, please? There's lots of books. I think one of the, a different kind of book maybe than what you might expect that I enjoyed recently is one called It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. Okay. And basically, that's a book that says, yeah, work hard, but work the way you want to, and also do a lot of other things with your life, and make sure that you have that balance. And so I'm very intrigued by the importance of that time with the family, with my dogs, with my children. Uh, even sometimes with my wife, sort of in that order, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, keeps me grounded and a lot of time out in nature, mm -hmm. walking around and enjoying that, and then coming back and sitting here on the Zoom and fighting the fight. And do you have a, a conservation hero, past or present? Well, there's lots, yeah. I had the incredible good fortune of spending some time with Jane Goodall, uh, in the Amazon, actually, we were both there for a week together. That was incredibly inspiring, and I continue to be amazed by what she continues to do. David Attenborough, of course, is incredible, and his latest documentary, A Life on Earth, about his life. Um, I was a little reluctant to watch because I, I kind of work on that stuff, and oh, I don't want to see another one of those. It's going to be depressing, but it was a really remarkable, very personal account from him of his life that I found very inspiring. Greta Thunberg, I think, is, I found find her incredibly inspiring as well, right? It's a, it's a very strange thing as a 54-year-old to be taught something by a teenager. It feels a little strange, but she is incredible in her authenticity, her honesty, her her fearlessness in speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. I've been in meetings where I've been nervous about doing that. And these days when that happens, I literally deliberately think about her and imagine her and then I do it. <laughs> and it really helps. That's amazing. It's a very strange thing. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, can I ask you just, uh, do you have any final remarks, Nigel? Uh, I think we've covered some good stuff here, Andrew, so I'm not sure what, what, what we can add to that. Perfect. Okay. Well, Nigel, listen, it's been absolutely fascinating speaking with you today. I want yeah. to thank you for, for the great work you're doing, and, and fingers crossed you'll be doing it for a lot more years to come. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and same to you.